Welcome back. It's now time to talk social media. But this time, we're talking addiction of social media. And uh, so it feels like a lot of us are in that WhatsApp group, as we say it in Nigeria, meaning that a lot of people are guilty. But the doctor will be, is here to help us separate what an addiction is and what it is not, as far as social media is concerned. We've been joined by Dr. Bonjibola Abiri, consultant, psychiatrist, managerial psychologist, and CEO of ReadyMed Consulting Services. Doctor, we meet again. Yes, we do. Thank We're you We're all much. in this WhatsApp group. <laughs> we are. To be honest, <laughs> we all are. And, uh, so help us unpack. So addiction is a strong word. Yes, it and is. And I know doctors don't use words lightly. So yeah. uh, let's be able to separate what just uh, being addicted and just loving social media means so that we can know how to appropriate uh, time to this you know, devices that are taking a lot of our time. All right, then. So thank you very much for having me and for the question. And so more often than not, like you rightly said, uh, professionals don't throw words out just like that. And so even in our, in our field of work, what we find is that we're not using the term addiction a lot because it's derogatory, it's demeaning to people, especially because, you know, addiction was always linked to drug addiction. And so the term to use most times these days is dependence. But even that shows you that there's an uncontrollable urge to use the um, social media. And so while social media is something that we've all gotten used to, uh, using it every day, scrolling on our phones, on our tabs, on our devices, when there's an uncontrollable urge to use, there's a problematic use of social media, such that it affects an individual's quality of life, interactions with people around them, the work that they're supposed to do or their academics, and they find that they continue to go back to that act. So, you know, for instance, some people will tell you, oh, I've deleted all the apps on my, on my phone because, you know, I've lost control. But after a while, what happens? They go back and they start to use. Then, of course, we've also found that people who are addicted or dependent also have physical and psychological effects, emotional effects. When they don't use, they feel sad, they feel overwhelmed, they feel like they're in despair, and there's this compulsive need to just use the social media. And so when we see that, when we see that, you know, people have, again, a compulsive urge, problematic use around it, and an inability to control their frame of mind, their selves around social media, we can actually go on to say that these individuals are social media addicted. So, hmm. Doc, there's, there's a, from what you're saying, there's a difference between dependence and addiction. And let me put this in context. Um, there was a time when we didn't have mobile phones. Uh, what we had were the uh, old... Um, landlines, yes. you know, and not all Nigerians, mm -hmm. you know, had it. It was the exclusive preserve of the very rich elite in the country. Yes. And now when you have, we have these devices and, mm -hmm. you know, it's stolen, we, we can't rest. Yeah. We can't sleep yeah. until we have that device back. Is it an addiction or dependence? All right. So the thing line between an addiction and dependence is that there's problematic use problematic use that affects the individual's quality of life, that affects the individual's interactions, that affects the individual's, you know, functioning. Functioning in relationships, functioning at work, or functioning with ad academics. And so what, you know, connotes a difference between both of them is the fact that there's a problematic use. And that problematic use often comes with, you know, certain criteria that we see. There's a compulsive urge to use. The individual cannot control themselves around it. When the individual is not using, there's something that is called, you know, there's just this continual desire to want to use, you know, yeah, there's this salience, I'm continually looking for it. Then, of course, there's the fact that when the individual comes into contact with social media, they're able to, they're unable to control themselves, you know. You tell yourself, oh, I just want to check one thing on social media, and then two hours later, <laughs> <laughs> you're still on social media streets. And then, of course, when it then starts to cause interpersonal problems between you, family, you know, your boss is at work, you neglect all the work that you're supposed to do, and you're sitting on social media, of course, what we see is that there's a big, big problem with addiction. Sorry, Jeffrey, let me, let me just come in here. Like, um, you know, cigarettes have nicotine yes. and, you know, some other um, you know, drugs have some addictive uh, content in them. Is there something in our devices that is, you know, that carries <laughs> an addictive content? So I'm, I'm very happy that you asked that question and I'm happy that you're laughing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you go on, a, if you do a search, a research, and a lot of research has shown that social media addiction is the addiction of the future. Now, what happens in addictions is it's not necessarily the substance that is used. It might just be the activity. 
Now, there's a part of the brain that is called the reward center. And we know that the brain is filled with neurons and there's a lot of neuronal activity going on there. And so as humans, even when the most basic things that we like are presented to us, so if you're hungry and someone gives you food, what do you feel? A sense of relief, excitement. What happens in the brain is that a significant neurotransmitter, dopamine, there's a dopamine rush. And so, like I said, it's not only in terms of a drug. It can be an activity. And so we've seen it with food, we've seen it with sex, we've seen it with internet, we've seen it with gambling, we've seen it with pornography. And so, yes, what drugs do to the brain is what the internet is starting to do to the brain. And so, you know, when you see the likes, the retweets, the mentions, think about how it makes you feel as an individual. You just feel on top of the world. Somebody sees me, somebody hears me. I feel validated by someone, even though you are behind the screen. So social media addiction is likened to drug addiction because of the neural processes that go on in the brain and the release of that neurotransmitter, the dopamine rush. So are we all technically unwell? <laughs> I like that you put it very tidily. And, you know, to be honest, while there are a couple of people who may have the social media addiction or the dependence or problematic internet use, there are actually some people who are tidy around the internet. They're able to do what they need to do. Some people are not even on any social media platforms, and I know people like that. But the average Nigerian or the average world person, if you ask, you hear that people are on at least between five to eight or even more social media platforms. And so there's an increased tendency towards technical unwellness. If we do not start to put measures and processes in place to identify that we can be at risk of a problem and start to checkmate you know, the things that we do. I mean, look at it from children to adolescents to adults to even old people. All of us are struggling with social media use. You know, and, and I like Jeffrey's question because some studies say that addiction are, you know, are manifestations of certain underlying causes like loneliness, mm. depression, anxiety. But some of us are not lonely, we're not depressed, we're not anxious. But we also have, you know, that uh, urge to keep returning to yeah. uh, social media. So um, I, that, that difference, it, does it cure us? Does it make us, you know, um, healthier than those who go there because of those underlying issues. So what drives people to use social media is different. Your personality, your personal preferences, your lifestyle, and your productivity. Some people use it for work, and we understand why they need to be on social media a lot. But if you get to that point where you have a problem, you know, monitoring your own use, controlling yourself around it, it's easy to say that you're not going there because you're not lonely. How do you know you're not lonely? How do you know you're not depressed? How do you know that you're not looking for it for validation or self-esteem? A lot of people are not even self-aware enough to be able to identify that this is why I keep going back to social media. And so you need to understand why you go back to social media, why you need to use social media. It would interest you to know that, you know, the recommended daily allowance that you should actually use around social media as an adult is three hours per day. Many of us are lost for hours online. We, we don't cook. Some people don't cook for children. Some people also give, you know, children devices and say that, you know what, just take this, let me also be able to rest and do my own thing. So when you see that you are unable to function, you have you know, deadlines that you're supposed to get to, you never get to them because you're on social media or you're on social media and you're constantly comparing yourself to other people, you're looking at the lives of other people wishing that you know, I could be this, I could be that, those could actually be your own you know, drivers or foilers of being on social media. So you need to always ask yourself, why am I on social media? So why does lack of productivity why is it so attractive? Is that a question that experts like you have considered? Because it looks like, oh, uh, there's no rigorous scholarship here. So I just want to look at somebody's picture. <laughs> this, this. Why is it? Because that, that is the other side of our question. Yes. You have an answer for us? Well, the lack of productivity as to why Nigerians go, keep going back or why people keep going back. Keep going back. Well, so again, it feels a need. There's a void that many people have. Like I said earlier, a lot of people want to be seen, to be heard, to be liked. Even in real life, when you're having conversations with people, we find that 40% of the time you're talking about yourself. Mm. On social media, with very minimal effort, you can put out a picture and hope that, well, maybe two hours later when I come back, <laughs> a, number, <laughs> a number of people would have liked this, retweeted it, commented. There's something that it does to the individual psyche. It boosts self-esteem. It boosts morale. It, it you know, livens the mood. It makes people feel, again, like what a drug would do to an individual. 
individual. And when that, when dopamine is in the body, ima imagine how you feel when you are excited, when you're ecstatic, when you're very happy. That is what social media does to you, especially with very, very minimal effort. So there, there's something I want you to help us out here. I'm a visual learner. Uh, so how, for visual learners like us who like to see a lot, I, I, look, I go to social media because I'm a journalist and I don't post that much. Uh, I'm a lazy person when it comes to social media. <laughs> I just go there to look at a lot of things. So how do you separate that from uh, having this dependence issue? Control. Power is nothing without control. If you're able to go in, do exactly what it is that you've highlighted that you want to do, fantastic. But you know how social media works. And I think that people also need to start learning that you see be behind a lot of these things, there's a lot of psychological work that has gone on. What will people like? What will drag them? What will make them come back? In fact, there are these lovely cartoons that show people using social media, but their hands are chained. And so every time they use, they keep going deeper. They can't stop. So if you can control yourself around social media, you have a definitive timeline, you say that this is what I want to do, you're not perturbed as to whether or not someone likes your picture or doesn't like your picture or is not asking you when you posted last, you're not perturbed about when you know, notifications come up. Some people, you should see them around social media. I, I once met a young lady who told me, if by the time she posts a picture and one hour later, 100 people haven't liked it, she will delete it because she feels like she's not good enough. Oh dear. That's, yes. Is that not an addiction already? Of course it is. It's a dependence. And a lot of her self-esteem and self-worth mm. is tied to the fact that do people validate me or do not validate me? And so for you, if you're able to go on, do what it says that you've highlighted that you want to do, achieve it, and you leave. You're a cool user. But unfortunately, uh, well, for no, other no, people... No, not totally that cool. <laughs> Look, we do, see, we, do, we do hardcore work on, on, on television as mm. journalists. So... I'm guilty of TikTok because TikTok just makes me laugh. I just, Bukola, maybe your question. <laughs> <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> oh, well, you're making me think a, a whole lot this morning. But, and I like what you said about asking yourself about why you return to social media over and over again and why you post, why you seek likes and validation. And it may, it may not necessarily be... Uh, because you're not lonely, even if you're not addicted. Yes. You know, brilliant. Lonely so that, mm. yeah, that, that compels me. If we're not asking those questions yes. and we're all doomed, <laughs> quote and unquote, uh, I hope not. What are the long-term effects? All right. So I'll leave this thought with all of us. There's this movie, The Social Dilemma, which x-rays the detrimental effects of social media. And so what it did was that it sat with a number of psychologists and a number of top people, you know, that have worked in many of these uh, social media sites. And what you find is that many of them protect themselves and their children from actually even using many of these things. And so what are the long-term benefits? The long-term benefits are different for different social demographics. For children, it's different. For adults, it's different. For adolescents, it's also very different. Physical, effects can happen. So for instance, the, the, there's the neck strain that happens because people continue to bend their necks and continue to use. There's what we call the carpal tunnel syndrome, where some people develop you know, pain in their wrist because they're continually you know, um, chatting and scrolling and all of that. There's also what is known as, of course, the doom scrolling. People keep looking for negative news. What else is negative? What else is negative? What else can I get here? There's poor sleep. There's poor appetite. There are body image issues because people are constantly con you know, comparing themselves to perfectly shaped models, quote and unquote, on social media. And there's really nothing like that. For the mental health you know, impact, depression, anxiety, self-esteem issues. And what we're beginning to find these days is that a lot of adolescents are tending towards suicide. Because as you know, they compare themselves to others, they're not, you know, they don't feel good enough about themselves. They're thinking, what's the worst that can happen? Let me just take my life. Of course, you also want to look at things like cyber stalking, you know, cyber bullying. Cyber crimes, pornography, all of that is on the rise as people continue to, you know, expose themselves to the dangers of social media. So you are the doc. How do you, <laughs> you know, discipline yourself? <laughs> well, so I'll be honest, like, you know, Jeffrey had said earlier on, we're all struggling. And so the first thing that we need to do is to admit that we're struggling or to identify that we can be at risk of a struggle, depending on how we interact with and use social media. Once you've identified that there's a problem, try to control yourself. If you can control yourself and say, okay, well, I'm going to the supermarket, I'll just leave my phone at home. You can go you know, around places, discipline yourself, and not take your phone around. Or you can tell yourself, at certain times of the day will only be the time that I'll use my social media. And you are successful at it, then you're doing well. Then there's something that researchers have said, that try to avoid your phone within the first hour of waking up 
and the last hour of going to sleep. More often than not, most people are, I wake up, and while they're thinking, oh, I should pray, I should do, no, 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 the first thing is, who has liked my picture? What's new on social media? And so people need to be able to control themselves around social media. When you've done that, turn off notifications. For me, notifications, you know, they, they frazzle me, they make me on the edge. So I've turned you off. I will come to it when I can come to it. Manage your energy around social media. At the top of the hour, is it when I want to check? Is it every three hours? What exactly am I doing on social media? Is it productive work or is it just... Is it for gossip? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, at the end of the day, if you find that you are still struggling, you might actually, like an individual who needs help for drug addiction, need to seek professional mental health care for social media addiction. So let, I know you just gave a generic you know, uh, solution, but let's, let's break it down to different groups. Yeah. Let's talk about man and wife. Mm -hmm. So you see a situation where people go for dates, they are still with their phones. <laughs> um, they go to bed, you're supposed to be gisting with your wife or your husband, you're with your phone. Yeah. How do they come around this? Now, I'll give you an example. So some people do business online. Yeah. Some don't do business. So I want you to aggregate all of these variables for man and wife. We're going to go in phases. Okay. So let's take man and wife first. All right. I think it would be nice to start with children. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So for children, any child less than two should have zero hours on screen time. Zero. Yes. That's WHO recommendation. Wow. Yes. Between three and five, you can give a child one hour screen time. And anything above that, within the adolescent years, children, children, have, children and adolescents, children have more than three hours of screen time. When you then come to the adults, we should be able to know when work is work and when work ends. So even if you say that you're doing maybe the change business online, you, need to, you also need to put restrictions in place. If you have a situation, and we do have those situations where people go out for dinner, they say they're watching a movie, <laughs> and half the time we're, you know, scrolling or chatting with someone else, and, you know, the other partner is looking at you and saying, and you say, this message has to go. Even when people are driving on major roads, mm. major highways, mm. you see them either, you know, scrolling or saying something. It can't wait. It can wait. Because, of course, dangerous accidents can happen. And so for when people need to go to bed, it's difficult, but you can put your phone in another room. There was a life before social media. And so I think that, again, power is nothing without control. If we keep giving our power away to social media, then social media is in charge of us. But if we you know, sit down and every family should individualize and discuss what they think works best for them, a lot of marriages and relationships have mm. broken down because people could not control themselves. They became impulsive around the use of social media. Yeah. And so it's important, like I've rightly said, every family should identify. There's some families that when it's dinner time, when it's meal times, it's bonding time, keep away your phones. When, it's, when there's specific times so or we're going out as a family, we're going to keep away our phones. And even the parents know that. We know that children also learn by watching. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of children, a lot of parents these days are complaining, my children don't read books. Your children mm -hmm. can't read books because they don't see you reading books. Mm -hmm. What they see you doing half the time is you're with a device. And so since they have devices, and you'll be surprised, most children have, they have a phone, they have a tab, they have a PlayStation, they have a Nintendo, mm -hmm. they have TV, they have Netflix. And when, you know, the power holding sticks lights for just five minutes, what are those children saying? Mommy, I'm bored. Mm -hmm. It's a big problem. Yeah, you know, so, so just because of, just, now, just a follow up to that question, because monetization of some of these things have actually made people go on overdrive, yeah. which I want you to address. Because mm -hmm. if not that way on TV, I would have used a worse word. The <laughs> level of senselessness yeah. we see on social media, there's no way to explain that this person is not just clickbaiting. Yeah, yeah. So how do we get ourselves? This is for adolescents. Uh, I'm an adult, so I, I may be able to make a decision for myself. But adolescents, um, they're still developing. Yeah. Uh, they're still finding their way around. So validation is key to them. Yeah. I want you to speak to that as well. I think it's particularly painful for children and adolescents because their brains are still developing. Their brains are still wiring. It's the reason why you can see that as an adult, you can take certain decisions. But that's also because you are self-aware and you can self-regulate. And so that responsibility falls back to us as adults, you know, you will have tough decisions with your children, especially because many of us have left them on the reins of do what you want, it's the holidays, you can sleep at whatever. Sometimes you wake up and you find children awake at 2 a.m. Mm. They have their tabs open, they have their laptops open, they have, 
almost five things. And they're, and they're not doing forex. And, and they're not doing forex. <laughs> <laughs> they're not bringing money home. They're using the electricity. You know, interestingly, when I used to have someone's conversations with my children, sometimes I say, it's because there's light. It's because there's internet. In those days, by nine, we went to bed. And so while there are pleasures of life that are supposed to make life easier for us as parents, we must stand in the gap for our children. And we must, of course, be the ones that show the templates, make them understand, because the children now are not like the children that we were. These ones will ask you questions. They would ask you why. Why? Why do you want me to do this? And so help them understand that while everyone else might be doing it, it's like when my daughter says, Mom, I want a phone. And I'm like, why do you want a phone? She goes, everybody in my class has a phone. That's not a good enough reason to have want a phone. You want to be able to communicate with me? we will find other ways to communicate. And so every family should individualize, but every family should also be very, very aware of the dangers because there are a lot of dangers. And so at the end of the line, I sit down and I'm seeing children who are dealing, children, eight, seven, adolescents who are dealing with pornography. And they've been doing it for years before their parents found out. Some are already gambling. Of course, they know their ways around all these areas. They're, you know, they have friends online. You know, they're, they're chatting with adults online. You know, in, in other countries, we've heard, we've heard of teenagers and sometimes children even getting killed by people that baited them out of their homes. So as adults, we need to take that responsibility on behalf of our children, make them understand, especially because the period of adolescence is also a time when adolescents struggle with self-esteem, self-worth, and self-perception. Help them understand that, yes, there's a lot of this out there, but until you find your own self-worth, until you understand who you are, until you love who you are, regardless of what the world standards are, you will struggle. And, you know, Doc, you just may have peeped into my notes, you know, with this last bit of commentary, but i also like you to speak partly to some of the issues as well. Uh, the data reporter that we quoted at the beginning of the program uh, says actually that there are over 100 million internet users in Nigeria. But of that number, it's just a, a meager 36.2 million that are active internet users. So I wonder if, you know, this is a problem manufactured by more money that we have had. And I say this for good reason. You know, prior to this time when we now have our devices that we are so addicted to, you know, I, I grew up on reading Famous Five, you know. Secret Seven, <laughs> all, all those enigmatic uh, books, you know, in primary school and in secondary school. I graduated to M&B and Temptations, you know, all those romance novels. So we used to do a lot of reading, but yes. we now have e-books. So I want you to speak first on, on the first hand to if this is a you know, problem manufactured by more money that we have on our hands and how we can you know, cure ourselves or, because it's also affecting the reading culture. Definitely. How we can return to the reading culture that we had with physical books that carried intimacy hmm. and this you know, disconnect that we now have with e-books. All right, so beyond more money, of course, there's technological advancement, there's innovation, and there's also that drive to want to be like the Joneses. So you hear that quite a number of people buy phones for their children because they don't want their children to be left behind with what is going on in the world. I'm old school, and so I'm likely to say that I will buy hard books because I want to, you know, scribble on them. I want to, and I do the same for my children. Um, unfortunately, and somehow fortunately, for many people, many people, you know, like e-books, the ease of, you know, being able to carry so many books and being able to reference them, you know, at a certain time. But it's also very important to also remember that, you know, some schools are also giving assignments, which is a major problem. Yeah. <laughs> Your child tells you, mommy, I'm doing my assignment, but by the time you come in, you say, <laughs> <Summer school. laughs> so, you have so many pages open and the child is, you know, very, very distracted. Again, we can't stop what technological advancements will do, mm. but we can be aware of what the advantages and disadvantages will be. Right. And we can also be aware of what we can plug in and get from. So again, it's discipline, it's control, it's being aware, it's being informed, and it's being able to take the best decisions for yourself and right. your family as you go on. All right, All right Doc, uh, 30 seconds if you can help me answer this. Not a, so, not a social media question, okay. but since you're a psychologist, are we over-educating children? The other day I was driving, and so children waking up by 6 a.m., going to school, They'll not be back till four. When I went to school, it was two o'clock, you're back. And then they do all of that six, five days a week. And then holidays, they are now saying uh, do summer school and all of that. We are over-educating. 30 seconds, my producer is for me to go. So to be, to be honest, the pressure on children these days is extreme. A few weeks ago, I saw a child who came in because of the pressure of schoolwork. And so, yes, it's not like it was in those days. It, mm. it, may, be, it may not be over-educating at the end of the day, but there's a lot of pressure on okay. children to perform. 
and children uh, are breaking down. Okay, I've just been told that we're <laughs> going to bring you back on this matter. Uh, but I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Okay. Bonjibola Abiri, consultant psychiatrist, managerial psychologist, CEO of ReadyMed Consulting Services. Thank you so much, as always, for coming through for us. Thank you very much for having me. And now we'll take that break. And when we come back, Omo Baba number one is our guest. Join us again.